that would be a real amusing thing to, uh, to recall to you. But I can't remember what it was that was so <laughs> I didn't realize I had written a book. <laughs> it's, um, I'll have to read it. <laughs> and I didn't realize that this still existed. Oh, I don't know if I could understand it or not. <laughs> a long time ago. Well, we figured that's the essence of the machine on that first page. <laughs> mm -hmm. It was not easy to unearth. So the, the guy who did computer archaeology to find it did a hard job to unearth this code. It's not easy to find it. The 1130 was a remarkable machine for its time. It was a, sort of the first mini computer. It was uh, desk size. And it was installed in a room which was five times as big as this room. <laughs> Huge factory to make carpets. It was full of looms, but the looms had been moved to South Carolina. So it was empty. You could see the marks on the floor where the looms had been. IBM installed this for Mohasco, and they put it in the middle of the room. So there was plenty of room on both sides and four and a half, and it was a long walk from the elevator to get to the computer. There was a power cord hanging from the ceiling. <laughs> it was a brutal programming environment. There was no air conditioning, there were windows. If I had a fishing rod, I could fish into the, uh, the creek that went by outside but I never got around to doing that. This was about the same season and the same uh, weather as here. And it got worse and the snow came and it was cold. And I had a ball. I had an interesting job to do and freedom to devise my own language, my own way of doing it. With no supervision, it was up to me. <laughs> They would judge my work based on the pictures I could put on the, uh, on the graphics monitor. And after a couple of months, they did. And the pictures were beautiful. They were animated. They were uh, high res, relatively. But they were in black and white. And what they wanted to do was design carpets. The carpets are keen on color. So they let IBM take the machine away. And I moved on to program the mainframe, B5500. And after a few months, we got a great order entry system working with remote lines, going to all their sales places in the United States. Cut them the state-of-the-art system, Univac. Oh, yeah, Burroughs had a 5500. Univac was going to install a new computer for them. In order to do this, they let us use this service center in Schenectady, Albany. This was in Amsterdam, New York, upstate New York, on the Mohawk River, and. Uh, uh, Albany was 50 miles away, and I had an MG, uh, MG oh. mm -hmm. and uh, the floorboards had rusted out, <laughs> and it was winter, and I got to drive 50 miles for third shift on this, uh, again, fun, I enjoyed every minute of it, we got this great system working, and then there was somehow a downturn in the carpet market, and uh, they canceled the project. 
and I went away. But um, I almost got a job offer from Univac because they were impressed with what I was doing. And that's the only time I ever almost got a job offer. <laughs> <laughs> Another story I'd like to share with you. Fourth thing was doing applications, mostly in astronomy to start off with. And we would go somewhere, and I would uh, port forth to their computer and install the astronomy package which we had developed at uh, Radio Telescope. And in two weeks, they had a telescope that was automatically pointing itself and doing state-of-the-art things again. One time, I encountered this computer. There were all different models of uh, many computers in those days. Everyone tried to come out with one that was a little bit different, though really they were all the same. Different instruction sets, of course, different assembly languages. So I would program, can't quite remember how I did this, but I would have a, a computer, a friendly computer with fourth on it. And I would use that to compile a version of fourth for the uh, strange computer. And the, my, the, my emotional attitude was wonderful. This was a wild computer I was taming. <laughs> and after a week or so, I had a system that was indistinguishable from the one on my own computer. And all of the application ported immediately to it. Now, this was a very controlled environment. I was the programmer, and I was compatible with myself. So I didn't have any standards to worry about. I didn't have to be backward compatible. But this computer, this particular computer, had no way of reading any media that I had. The problem was, how do I get the program into the computer? Whereupon I could write its tape and, uh, and get on from there. But it had a printer-ready bit. In those days, printers were an important accessory and the computer would talk to the printer, and the printer would signal whether it was ready or not. So I hooked up my RS-232 wire to the printer ready bit and bit banged a copy of fourth into the computer. <laughs> now, in order to do this, I had to get a bootstrap on the computer that would read the printer ready bit. You did this in those days with an array of keys in front of the computer. You would key in instructions, uh, 16 bits probably, and you'd key in 10 or 20 of them in order to have enough code to actually do something. And it worked beautifully. I could fine tune my bit rate to conform to what their bit rate was. And once I got over in the computer, of course, Force could take over and recompile itself, and I, was, I, was, I had a tame computer again. But that's the hardest interface I ever had to deal with. <laughs> to fast forward, I had been asked what I was going to do now, which is a somewhat impolite question because it argues that I should be doing something now and uh, perhaps make up for what I hadn't been doing before. <laughs> and that is exactly right. I have been idle for a couple years. Well, not <clears throat> idle. But I haven't done anything productive. I've been playing around with some fourths. I have been hiking a lot. Um, most recently, I've been trying to get 4K streaming on my new internet uh, access. I've got 50 megabits per second. 
which is too much for anything except 4K streaming. <laughs> yeah. But I haven't succeeded yet. Uh, for some reason, Amazon Prime won't give me 4K, it gives me 2K. Um, I have to maybe have to buy a new computer in order to make up for my new internet. But one of the things I've been doing, the most interesting one, is coming up with a new version of Forth that is, I, I, I'd like to call it Metal Forth, but then it probably was taken. I got a Raspberry Pi, and I played around with that for a couple of months, and I got Forth running on it. Um, and that was called getting down into the metal. The challenge was to somehow boot a, a naked fourth without any operating system, without any system subroutines. And I could do that. But eventually I ran out of knowledge. I tried and tried and tried. I couldn't figure out how to use the, the other cores. I could only use the main core. And there were words on the internet that led me to believe I could do this and that, and uh, they didn't lead anywhere. Eventually, I got tired of not knowing how to run the computer. I had previously encountered that in trying to program my iPhone, and um, I learned to use the Swift programming language, which was awful, <laughs> uh, using their development system, which was even worse. I just couldn't, I just couldn't cope with it. But I did enough to learn that I wasn't going to get anywhere near the metal. The most I could hope to do was ask for a key press, and it would give me a key press if there ever was one. And that wasn't fun. So I decided to get close to the metal on the PC. Now this is a, a challenge because they really don't want you to do that. It, it, it's just like programming in a sandbox. You're going to be protected against everything, including yourself. And that simply is not my style. I want, I want to make the mistakes. I want to crash the system. If I burn out the disk, hey, that's OK. I'll buy a new disk. <laughs> what I found was that the PC, I don't know what to call the computer, the Core i7, it doesn't have a stack. It has a hardware stack, but only one. And to implement a data stack is really clumsy. So I said I'll put the stack in the registers. And when force sees a, a number, it puts it on the top of the stack. It puts it in register zero. And if it sees the word fetch, it will fetch from the address in register zero and put the result in register zero. This is exactly what would happen if it was a stack. But I want to use the other registers. So I devised a superscript. If you put a number with a superscript, it will put the number in that register. There are plenty of instructions to do these things. The question is to have some kind of syntax that, that explains it. And the syntax used by the assembler is verbose and confusing and <coughs> totally unsatisfactory. Superscripts are the answer. If I say number, fetch, it happens. If I say number, number, fetch, then you've got the problem. That's why I say number, number, superscript one, which goes in the register one, and then fetch. And it will fetch, as before, from register zero to the result of register zero. If I say fetch, superscript one, it will fetch from the address in register one and put the result in register zero. If I say fetch one, two, it will fetch from the address in one 
and put the result in register two, and so on and so on. And, and, uh, it, it works remarkably well. I'm very pleased. I want to explore it further. I want to have access to the full instruction set of the uh, computer in hopes that, what well, one, I can write more efficient code, but more importantly, I can have fun in figuring out how to do things in a clever way. There's one gotcha. I, I recommend any of you to try this if you, if you wish. It's a, it's a good exercise. I need superscripts from 0 to F. And uh, they don't exist. If you look at character sets, sometimes you can find superscripts, often not. Uh, 0 and 1, well, 1, 2, and 3 usually are the only ones you can get. But that didn't matter because I'm working to develop a Colorforth. And Colorforth generates its own characters, right? I've got, Colorforth has a bitmap set of 48 characters, I guess. Well, that's not quite enough. Uh, I need 10 more characters for the uh, superscripts. And these characters are stroke characters instead of bitmap characters. So I'm doing things differently, as differently as I can, because that's where the fun lies. On the other hand, it's all the same. It starts the same place, ends up the same place, and all I have to show for it is the pleasure in doing it. I don't think there's any commercial opportunity. I don't think there's any, I don't expect any of you to uh, do anything like it or to use my system. Um, but that doesn't matter. I never wrote forth for you. <laughs> I always wrote forth for me. And I've been criticized in Colorforth because of colorblind programmers. They're handicapped. But I, I, that wasn't my intention. And there's all kinds of workarounds. So I've had a lot of fun, 50 years worth of fun. It hasn't been well. I started at the same time as Bill Gates. <laughs> and he took a different strategy. He was selling an operating system, and I didn't believe in operating systems. I was selling applications. And I could only sell as many applications as I could program, or as Forthink could program. Um, boy, did I miss the boat there. We could have sold Forth as an operating system, as a programming language, as a development system. And we didn't. So I guess he deserves the $50 billion or $100 billion or whatever he's got. But I had the fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs>